chapter 3, verse 23, reading this one verse, which is the, <coughs> the introductory verse to a very long uh, genealogy, but uh, let, let's read verse 23. Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, and then Joseph's genealogy follows. We want to read that one verse. Jesus, uh, at 30 years of age, he's beginning his public ministry here. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. Bless it to the hearts of the hearers today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So this is the beginning. It's actually the introductory to Jesus' baptism. He's beginning his ministry, and this makes a point. Luke makes a point that he began to be about 30 years of age. And then they'll think, well, what, why was that important? Luke understood it was important, I believe, because according to the Jewish law, before someone could become a high priest, the Old Testament says they had to be at least 30 years of age. And then there was three requirements. They had to be uh, sprinkled with clean water, which is a type of baptism. This is the introduction to Jesus' baptism. And they had to be called of God, which the writer to Hebrews makes that point that Jesus was called of God. So I'm going to try to do something that I've never heard of anybody doing before, and there may be a reason for that. Maybe some, Surely somebody's done this before. We're entering into the summer doldrum months here after Memorial Day, so uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try to preach a series on hiking with Jesus. If it goes well, we might even... Well, Jesus did a lot of walking, by the way. Jesus did a lot of hiking. And if, and if you look at, through the parallel Gospels, you can follow along with him. And it's amazing how many steps Jesus walked in his, in his ministry. And if it goes good, we might do hiking with Paul afterwards. <laughs> Paul covered a lot of miles too. But I've noticed Paul liked public transportation as much as he could. Every time Paul got a chance, he got on a boat, didn't he? And went somewhere else. But Jesus' primary mode of transportation seemed to be they always hiked, they always walked somewhere. And it's amazing, if you follow his ministry, he would take these long, circuitous routes, and he'd, he'd come back home for a while, and then he'd go on another one. For three and a half years, this went on. So we can break it down into the different periods of ministry, and, and today is, is the beginning. This is the beginning of, of Jesus' ministry. At 30 years of age, He's going to present himself to John to be baptized in the, in the Jordan River. Now, my longest hike that I ever did was like five days. I remember several years ago, 15, 16, 17 years ago, this time flies. Uh, uh, John hauled me up to uh, on my vacation one year after, uh, after the uh, homecoming day on Sunday. I had a week off. Monday morning, John hauled me up to uh, the Smokies. The 129 bridge there where the Smokies on one side and the National Forest. And I had him let me out and I just walked back home. I spent, I think, five days doing that. And that's the longest. It was kind of a mini version of my dream when I was like 12 or 13. I remember sitting in the, a school room up at Inglewood Elementary School and somebody had a picture of the Appalachian Trail hanging on the wall. The teacher did. And I remember looking at that all year and that was my dream. I wanted to... My version of it is I wanted to one day get on an airplane and get somebody to fly me to Maine and start at Mount Katahdin and just walk back home. I didn't care nothing about doing any of that southern part. I just wanted to walk back home from Maine. Well, I never did get to do that, but I did a few little mini versions of it. Uh, that was only like 55 miles I did. Seemed like a lot to me, but, you know, after that, after a week and 55 miles, I was glad to take a shower and be home, you know. It's fun for the first few few days, and I'd do that for several years, but uh, that's nothing compared to what Jesus and his disciples would do. The very beginning is when Jesus presents himself to be baptized, he's leaving his hometown of Nazareth. And if you look on the map, John's baptizing at Bethabara beyond Jordan. That's 75 miles away. So for Jesus to leave home and to go be baptized, that, that's a 75-mile hike right off the beginning there. He walks down the Jordan River, down river, camping on the riverbanks as he goes. And, and I just started thinking about that as, a, as I remembered, you know, I, I like to read outdoor stories, you know, uh, uh, hiking trips and hunting trips and canoe trips and things like that. You can just kind of travel along and experience it too 
and I got to thinking about Jesus camping out on the on the banks of the Jordan River there, and and uh, it, it reminded me of uh, Calvus back here wrote a about his canoe trip that he took several years ago. He put in up there at the snorkel hole on the Conestoga River, and he he built his own canoe, and he canoed all the way down to the I think the I seventy five bridge at Calhoun, Georgia, and where he called Betty to come pick him up. And then he wrote a story about that, and it was published in a magazine. And I, I, I can still remember, it's been quite a number of years ago that I read it. But, you know, you can read and you just travel along with somebody like that, and you can experience that. And, I, you know, I, I, could, I could experience uh, when he got in those shallow shoals and having to drag that heavy canoe across and get it back in the water where he'd get going again. I, I remember uh, I could experience about when he uh, would stop at a place to camp overnight. Almost stepped on a copperhead, didn't he? <laughs> so I can remember that. I read that 10 or 15 years ago. So I got to thinking about Jesus hiking down the, the Jordan River and camping on the banks of the river o overnight. And, and uh, you sit, sit there by him, and I, I don't know, did, did he build a fire? Most people would when they camped. They could hear the maybe the wolves howling, maybe the frogs in the river. A big fish jumps out there in the night somewhere. And it just starts to come alive as you, as you think about that, being on the riverbank camping like that. And if he was by himself, as I believe he was in this first part here, he hasn't called any disciples yet, then uh, what a time to reflect, to sit down there on the riverbank at night and just think. As he's headed toward... John, who's baptizing down there 75 miles from, from home. And then, then he finds John, and, and he's been, he presents himself for baptism. Now, John's out there baptizing a baptism under repentance. He said, repent or perish, right, for the kingdom of heaven. And he sees Jesus, and the Holy Spirit identifies him as Jesus. And John says, whoa, I can't baptize you. You should be baptizing me. John knew that Jesus didn't have any baptism to any sins to repent of for a baptism of repentance, but Jesus objected and said, We must fulfill all righteousness. And whatever that meant, John said he understood it and he, he baptized Jesus at that point. I believe that Jesus' baptism was different than yours and I's. It was an example for us, but it was also Jesus presenting himself to begin his public ministry as our high priest, who had to be baptized, 30 years of age, and called of God. When he, when he told John, we've got to fulfill all righteousness, see, that's obeying the law, and that's what Jesus was doing. So he's baptized by John, and then immediately he hikes 10 miles over into the wilderness where he camps out for another 40 days. 40 days, Jesus is there in the Judean wilderness, and... Somehow, I don't know how, but somehow I believe Deuteronomy chapter 6 was involved in that camp. It might have all been in Jesus' head or possibly he had a scroll that he'd been studying those 40 days over there. But I do know this, when Satan tempted him, he quoted Deuteronomy 6, the Jerusalem blade, the word of God to him. Now, he's out there for 40 days, and we're going to say, well, that wasn't his first public miracle. But you know what? I think that was Jesus' first at least recorded for us his first ministry after he's been baptized by John. And who was the ministry to? It's just him and the devil. He wasn't ministering to the devil, but it's recorded in the Bible he's ministering to you and I. So what's the great lesson of that? Jesus says, if you want to do battle with evil, what did Jesus do to fight the temptation and to conquer the devil? Every time he quoted the word of God. If you want to do battle with evil, it, Jesus didn't have opinions or this is what I think or what somebody said. He said, thus saith the Lord. That still holds true today. The only thing we've got to stand on is God's word. And if we're going to do battle with evil, then we have to say, it don't matter what everybody else thinks, that this is what God says. I went out this morning and... Uh, Dad's great grandmother's rose had bloomed yesterday, and it only a little wild rose, just you know that's uh, been in the family for all them years, passed down through the generations. And I've got it there at the house, and it blooms, and those blooms only last usually a few days, and they're gone. I saw it yesterday, so I went out this morning to feed the horse, and I, I, I 
took my camera because I, I like to get a picture of it every year. This year it's got three really nice pink, pinkish red blooms on it. And I was out there making a picture of that just right after daylight and the sun just getting on it this morning. I was thinking, Lord, what a beautiful day it is. And then I, I don't know why this came into my head. I said, I, I feel sorry for people that are miserable on a beautiful day like this. <laughs> and forgive me, but the next thought was, I don't know if the Lord, I'm going to say the Lord told me this, but I may be wrong. Maybe it's just me, but I thought, I thought I heard in my mind, you know who the most miserable people in the world are today? There's still a handful of conservative preachers in my former denomination. <laughs> And whether it's for the love of money or what, but they, instead of having the guts to do the right thing, they're still sitting there, and I know they're miserable. And they will be miserable. And God's going to keep them miserable until they do the right thing. And what do you base it on, preacher? The only thing I base it on is say, hey, the right thing is thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord that I can't participate in this anymore. If I'm going to do battle with evil, then I'm going to stand up and say, here's what God says, and I'm going to take a stand for God's word. Jesus showed us that in his first ministry that he did, to, did for us there. So then after the 40 days in the wilderness, he hikes the 10 miles back to where John was baptizing. And... According to John chapter 1, I believe you'll find he then he went about on the seashore or on the, on the shore of the Jordan there in the, in the Sea of Galilee, and he called six disciples. Bam, 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 bam. I believe it's Andrew who first goes and finds his brother Philip, and then he finds uh, or, or, uh, Peter, and then he finds Philip, and then he finds Nathaniel, and then there's James and John. I believe there's six disciples called in John chapter 1 as he begins to gather his disciples up. And then when he gathers some disciples up, then they decide that they're going to travel, for, uh, uh, travel north again to Cana, which is 80 miles. So 80 miles northward they walk, and if they walk at about 10 miles a day, which is... That's kind of like where I always like to hike. About ten, it, it's easy to do more than that, but 10 miles a day is enjoyable. I've known people, I, I, I never could do it. I, so I've known people knock off like 30 miles a day, you know. Big old long-legged lanky boys usually, you know. <laughs> but to me, I just thought, if I was trying to push it like that, that's like running a, a race. I'm out here to enjoy the, the surroundings, and if I see something I want to stop and look at, I'm not worried about losing miles and losing time. I just want to enjoy what's going on. Most I ever walked in one day, I did 23 miles one time, and it was too far for me when I was in my 40s. I, I got up at, on Holly Flats up there and up on Broad River one morning, and I, I was going to um, spend the night in Coker Creek and then go on to the house the next day. And I walked the road up across Wachese and back off the horse trails and came down to Doc Rogers Field, and I was there at Doc Rogers Fields by about 4 o'clock, and that's where I was going to spend the night, but I thought there's a little old store about a half mile up the road. I bet they're still open. I went up there, and I sat down, and I went in, and I got me a big old Mountain Dew. When you walk all day for a few days, you start craving sugar and stuff, you know. And I got me a big old Mountain Dew, and I sat down in that rocking chair, and I went in there and got me some cookies and stuff, and I got, I think it was a knee-high grape, and I drank that, and then I went in there and got some more candy bars and cookies and stuff, and I was sitting in that rocking chair, and I got me another Mountain Dew. <laughs> And I drunk it, and it was getting late in the evening. I took my pack and stuff up there with me, and I was looking down that road, and I thought, I feel pretty good. I believe I can go on home <laughs> and take a shower and sleep in my bed tonight. By then, it was about five or six. It's getting dark. It's November, first week of November. It's getting dark, but I thought, I can do it. It's all road walk to the house now, another 10 miles or so. So I, I took off down through there, and, uh, and, and the first five or six, I was on that sugar high, and I was doing just fine. And, boy, when I started getting down there closer to, I actually left my, my Bronco at a friend's house about two miles from my house, but it was 23 miles total. But the last three or four miles, I, I was honestly, the only time in my life, just concentrating, telling my feet, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, and every step was getting rough. And I was carrying a heavy pack, too, you know. But I did 23 miles, but I made it home that night. 
Now, I don't know how many miles Jesus and his disciples traveled in a day, but I know one thing. I was wearing Timberland hiking boots. They were walking around in sandals. Now, I know their feet was a lot tougher than mine, too, because I remember when I was a kid, when May got here, we run around barefooted all summer long. I could run down a gravel road barefoot and didn't even flinch, you know. I can't walk across one barefoot, you know. <laughs> the true meaning of tenderfoot, you know. We wear shoes year-round. Now, I do. I may, do any of the kids ever go barefooted anymore? But, but we did, and we, we liked it. But, uh, I, so I'm assuming Jesus and the disciples, they probably did about 10 miles a day. So if they were going back to Canaan for 80 miles, it would take them about a week at 11 and a half miles a day. And they're going to a wedding. And, and they get back up there, and, and, and the wedding's going, going on, and, you know, the story, the, they run out of wine, and Mary comes to Jesus and says, you know, fix this, and he turns the water into wine, does his first public miracle that's recorded in the Bible for us here. This is the beginning of his miracles, which, by the way, I, that hit me one day. They've got these books going around the the lost gospels and all this stuff, and they got Jesus doing things when he's a boy, turning miracles and things. And I read that in the Bible one day and said, that ain't true because the Bible says what he did there at Canaan said, this is the beginning of his miracles. This is the beginning of his miracles when he turned the water in, in, into wine. But the, the main point Jesus gave us in his first miracle there is everybody realized that, hey, the good master has saved the very best to last. Don't ever forget that because that's the point. We can do all the other stuff, get bogged down in the details of that story about the wedding at Cana, but the number one point is that the Lord saves the best to last. It starts out good when you're walking with the Lord, but it gets better and better. That's no matter where you are in life, no matter how bad or how good it may be in life. You can always say, as you're, if you're a Christian, you can always say, the best is yet to come. Amen. We're going to heaven one of these days, folks. We're going to heaven one of these days if you, if you signed up to be a walking with the Lord. We're going to have to sing that song for this series, of when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. I don't know, I was thinking today, Ken, I said, you know, the Lord's a great record keeper. I wonder how many miles me and Ken Jones walked together on all these trails in the last <laughs> decade and a half plus or something. I said, I, I don't know, but we can get to heaven and we can find out because the Lord's a great, he can tell us how many steps we took. He can tell us how many trees we've cut with a chainsaw, how many trees we've cut with, the Lord's a great record keeper. Y'all realize that? He's got a record even of every human being from the Garden of Eden to whenever he comes back that has trusted in Jesus. I hope your name's on that list. If it ain't, it ain't too late. It can be before you leave church house today. Amen. But put your trust in, in Jesus. The Lord's a great, he's got a record of that. And your name will be found on the day of judgment there, those that have trusted in, in Jesus. So, then after the wedding, they, they travel on up to Capernaum. Now, this is just the beginning of Jesus' ministry, this first route. So he, Capernaum was 25 miles from the wedding. So they traveled 25 miles up. He took his mama. According to the scriptures, he took his mama, he took his brothers, and he took his disciples, and they went on up to Capernaum, 25 more miles to hike. And the scripture says, and they continued there not many days. I, I don't remember which gospel that comes out of, but it sounds like Luke because you read Acts and Luke. Luke was a master of using the diminutive. He'd say, he'd say stuff. They continued there not many days. We'd say they stayed there a few days. Not many days, but a few days. And if they continued there at Capernaum not many days, it, it seems to me like that was a place that they, they kind of took a little bit of a break there. And I find Jesus doing that in the scriptures. And here's a point for you as we journey through these scriptures together there. If Jesus needed to do a little R&R &R every once in a while, so do you. If Jesus need, I believe as I've read the scriptures all my Christian life about Jesus that, I don't know, we'll find out when we get to heaven, but just doing a little psychology on, the, on, on Jesus here. I think Jesus is like a lot of us, an introvert. He was an introvert as a human being. Most preachers are introverts. That's not a bad thing. 
Most people are probably in, in this room are, are introverts. Psychology says the introverts, they function like this. They do. Introverts, they, they go out and they, they, they give their energy to other people as they're out in the world and among people, but yet then that drains them and they need to withdraw and have alone time to recharge their batteries. You notice Jesus doing that? He goes out into the crowds and he ministers to the multitude and then he withdraws most of the time with his disciples, but sometimes he leaves the disciples and said he departed alone into a wilderness place and spent time with God. Sometimes just a stone's throw away from his disciples, he'd go out there and pray. Or sometimes he'd just take the three, Peter, James, and John, they'd go up on a mountain apart somewhere, and then he'd come back to the people every time. If Jesus was needing that R&R, &R, then we do too. Sometimes we think we don't. We get into a holy distraction. We think we're doing God's work. We've got to do this. We've got to do this. And we don't take any time to ever have any downtime and recharge your own batteries. Or maybe we should let God recharge our batteries. If, if Jesus did that in the scriptures, then that's definitely an example for us too. So, so we need it to. In closing, let me sum these little routes up here in the beginning circuit of his ministry today is this. So this will teach you something about reading our Bibles too. When we read and think about these journeys, it's easy to just read our Bibles and it's just words on a page. God don't want it to be a dead letter like that. Did you notice that when, when God gave us the, 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 the Bible, it was in a time that it came in the form of a book. He didn't wait till we had movies or TVs. It was the printed word that was important. And I believe there's a reason for God's timing in that, a lot of reasons. Too, but one of them is that, you know, when we watch a movie, it's real easy to just be completely passive and it don't engage your brain. And whoever made the movie, they did all the imagination part for you and they filled in the gaps. But when you read a book, any book, your mind gets active and you kind of travel along in the journey and you see things in your mind and you... You hear the fish jumping and the owls calling and the things that's in it too. And, and that's why reading, that's why how many times have you read a book and then you're excited because they made the movie and you go watch the movie and you say, well, the movie ain't near as good as the book. Because the book, the, the, the book made you imagine it and your, create your world to fill in the gaps. I think reading the Bible is a lot like that too. It, it sticks with us more and it speaks to us more when, when we use our own imagination. That's a God's gift, by the way, the gift of imagination. When we use our own imagination and our own life experiences that we can identify with these things. We can think about Jesus and the disciples hiking and camping on the riverbank together because we've been there, we've did that sort of thing too, and we can identify with it. Now, the book is here because... The book gives us the bare bones, and the, it, we, we can't just use our imagination, or then we'd end up like a lot of people have done. They, they create a Jesus of their own imagination, but we've got to stick close enough to the book to realize we're following the biblical Jesus, not some imaginary Jesus. But we sit close to the book, and we fill in the gaps, and we identify. It's like the words come alive, and Jesus becomes... Human, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. He was 100% human. He is 100% God. But we identify with him through these human experiences. So we can identify with Jesus getting tired and sitting on a well while the disciples go get groceries. The weary Jesus. We can identify with Jesus who sheds a tear at his friend's funeral even though he knows he's going to bring him back from the dead. It's when we get inside the scriptures and let them speak to us and walk around that they really come alive. I believe we read them the way that God wants them to. It's like, it wants us to. It's a, well, let me, let me give you this else. I was reading a book here, here a while back and a, a guy wrote it as a school teacher. It's a true, true story. It's about 100 years ago and I was reading about him. It's a, called The Thread That Runs So True. Kind of an obscure book. But he was talking about going on a, on a walk one, one evening. He had to go from one town to the next town. He had to go across the mountain. When he got up on the mountain, the snowstorm was more than they didn't have weather forecasting back then. But uh, it, it got so bad he lost the road walking. 
and he was going to die probably, but he, he stumbled into a farmer's field, and the farmer's field, uh, as they did back in the day, the corn sh were s situated in shocks, you know, little teepee-like things. And, and he crawled inside of one of them and spent the night and waited out the storm and how he survived. And I was sitting there reading that, and I was just, I could feel, I could hear the wind, and I could, you'll see the snow and the darkness there, and I was just right inside that corn shock with him. And, and when you read the Bible like that, it's a book too. That when you read the Bible and you travel along with them and you experience that, man, it comes alive and you'll remember it. Just like I remember John's story that he wrote 15 years or so ago, and I only read it one time, and it was way back then. Don't ever let it become a dead letter. It's a very exciting book. It's the living Word of God. And when you begin to, to read it like that, is when you can come to, like, for instance, the cross. Instead of just reading about the cross, you can experience the, the grief and the pain and the suffering of Jesus and the suffering of his mother standing there watching him nailed to a cross. And you can, you can experience all that, and it becomes real to you. And then three days later, you can experience the jubilation of the empty tomb. It's not just words. It's life experiences that's important to you and I. I can identify with old King David when uh, he was walking beside the still waters because I walked beside the still waters. I've laid down in the green pasture before and listened to a choir of crickets singing all around my head on a cool October day before there in the tall green grass. But when I read that about David walking beside the still waters and walking, Lying down in the green pastures, why I, I'm right there with you. And I understand what David wrote next when he wrote about that. And he said, he restores my soul. There's something about that that's that soul restoration. That's that R&R &R that we all, we all need. It's not, it, we've got to let the Bible come alive to us. And once, once the Bible comes alive to us, like uh, we begin to, to listen, not just what the printed words are on the page, but we can begin to hear that small, still voice of God. And it becomes personal to us when we run across those promises of God. And we realize that's not just words in a book written long ago, but that's the word of God spoken right to my heart just the same as if God was sitting here talking to me and saying it right now because he is. All those promises, whosoever call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It becomes personal to you then when you're, when you're maybe flipping over in the Psalms or the Proverbs. I don't remember which one this verse is, but I remember the verse because it's important to me. Can't give you chapter and verse or even book, but somewhere in Psalms or Proverbs, the Lord said, my child, give me your heart. And when you hear that, it's not just words on a page, but God speaking to you. The Bible comes alive, and it becomes exciting to you, and it becomes important to you. And it's not just something to throw on the coffee table and gather dust and pick it up and take it to church on Sunday. It becomes something that you get hungry for. And boy, once you get hungry for it, that's when God goes to work in you and through you. Let's pray together. Lord, as we journey with Jesus, I call it hiking with Jesus here today. As walking, you did a lot of walking, Lord. We call it hiking today. But Lord, we, we thank you as we can go and follow him through this journey, Lord, that uh, we remember that we're walking with Jesus daily down here as disciples, uh, followers of his today, Lord, but to help the Bible come alive to us. Help us to claim those promises, Lord. Help us to want to get in there and get hungry and follow Jesus around and, and listen to what he's got to say to us and to the world. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.